Hey everyone, Bill Nichols here, Bill Nichols TV, bringing you a video today about Part 107 waivers and what waivers have been granted, what you need to do to apply for a waiver if you're looking for an exception to Part 107, your remote pilot certification. And I'm uh, just giving you a, a good rundown in a great blog post today by Alan Perlman from jumppilotgroundschool.com. We're gonna jump through that blog post, show you some of the things that he talks about with your waivers getting accepted or declined, and uh, just a quick video today on Part 107 stuff that updates for you on what's kind of happening in the week to come. All right, everybody, so today let's talk about Part 107 waivers. Since I have been posting these Part 107 videos and just overall with my experience from going through Drone Pilot Ground School to taking the test to passing and some others, one of the more common questions that I've had is, one, am I applying for any waivers? Have I applied for any waivers? And what's the status on them? So to date, I haven't applied for any waivers. I do have some that I'm going to plan for and that I'm probably in the next six months going to have to apply for and we'll see if they go through or not. But I wanted to bring you a couple of resources today with some tips on how you apply for waivers, what kind of information you need to have in there, and what has the FAA granted so far. So right now, almost all of the waivers that have been granted have been for daylight operations and flying outside of daylight time. So, you know, that's 30 minutes before or 30 minutes after sunset outside of those windows. The vast majority of the 120 or so waivers that have been granted have been for that among some others. I'm going to put all of these links below um, in the description so you can go through here and see. So the first place that I want to go to is I'm going to take you to the FAA website and show you where you can go look at existing waivers that have been granted, what they've mostly been for, and we'll jump through one of them, one or two of them, and show you. So let's go right in here. So we're at the FAA, so FAA.gov, and you go forward slash UAS request waivers, waivers granted. So in here, to apply for a, a waiver to Part 107, please complete the waiver request form. And basically, you would apply for a waiver if you needed to do something like flying multiple aircraft, flying over people, flying outside of daylight hours, flying in restricted airspace, um, you know, or in those controlled airspaces like A, B, C, D, or E. So this is what you would apply for a waiver for. You want to give yourself right now about six months for these waivers. So if you're having shoots that you're going to need to apply for a waiver for, you want to plan those shoots well ahead of time. Let your clients know that you're going to have to get a waiver if you're going to need to, and then apply for that waiver and have it granted or have it decline, and then you've got to reapply. So what I've done right here is I've gone through. So if we go to the bottom, there are... 140 waivers so far that have been granted. And if we just look through, you've got the date, the expiration date, the company, who it is, and the waiver regulation, and then the status, approval or deny. We're looking at all the ones that have been granted. So if you look here, almost all of these, daylight operation, operation of multiple unmanned aircraft, and it gives you the sections of Part 107 that they're getting a waiver for. So daylight operation is FAA Part 107.29, and they're getting an exception to that part of the that part of the regulation. So if we go through almost all of these, here's operation of unmanned aircraft, daylight operation, uh, multiple unmanned aircraft, so multiple drones, multiples, daylight, visual line of sight, and visual observer. So this uh, company, Precision Hawk Inc., Thomas Wan. They had one approved. So let's just pop into an application or into the grant and show you what's being provided here when you get this. So here's the certificate of waiver that you get. So you would carry this with you during your shoot. And if anybody had a question about it, um, whether there's an authority that came by or something, you could show them this waiver and that you're operating in accordance with this waiver that's been granted and the restrictions or the stipulations that have been applied in this waiver. So it basically says that this has been, here's the address. This certificate is issued for operations specifically described in here. So the waived regulations by section and title, they're waiving 107.31 and 107.33. So for, VL, for VLOS and a visual observer. So basically in here, they've got a, a bunch of pages. And um, so they go through, they said that they've reviewed the application. And here's what's being waived. And, um, and if you go through, they will have the special provisions. So they tell you what you can operate, what you can do under the um, subject of this waiver. And so they've got all the pieces here, and, um, and then that's your basic certificate of waiver. So you would print this, take it with you, maybe keep one electronically so that you would have it on you during a shoot. So 140, right now there aren't any that have been applied for or that at least have been granted for flying in controlled airspace. So I do have a shoot coming up next year. Um, it was going to be earlier this year because up until now, Previously, you could, if you were part 333 or you're part 107, you could call up the control tower and get 
access to controlled airspace by letting a control tower know, and if they granted it, great. Now that no longer happens. Now you've got to go through this formal waiver process. And the FAA at Interdrone talked about this and that it's going to become a lot more mainstreamed and that they are going to provide these applications here so that people can see what has worked. And if they have a very similar one, they can basically copy an application, replace with their information, submit it, and then hopefully the granting process will go quicker. So if you need to apply for one, you go to this waiver request form here, and we'll just jump into it really fast and go through it. So they have um, that you've got these two instructions, the performance-based standards and the waiver airspace authorization instructions. And they basically have this form. You have your responsible person, mailing address, who was the remote pilot, what's the airman certificate number. So you get that when you pass your 107. Then you go on to IACRA, create a login, upload your test result, your test exam number there. They download it, then they go through the FAA, they go through the process, and then you get your airman certificate number. Your SUAS, you need to have the make model and the aircraft registration number. So you need to have the registered aircraft that this waiver is being tied to. And you can add multiples if there are gonna be multiples. And then you have your waiver or your airspace authorizations that you're looking for here. So if you're looking to fly in, say class C airspace, you know, in, a, in an area and trying to get off authorization there, you would check 107.41. Your start date, your start time, your end date, your end time, local time zone, proposed area of operations, the height that you're going to fly, what is the maximum altitude that you're going to fly, and then if the waiver is site specific, you can put the center point of the site here, and then what is the radius from that, and they basically have it in less than one nautical mile, uh, one to five or something like that, so less than one, one to two, two to three, what is the nearest airport, class of airspace, and they have you ask a bunch of questions, then you submit this, and then you wait, and you see if you're granted or not. So that is um, the waiver process and what has been granted so far. So you can go right to this link, which is down below, and view any of the granted waivers so far, see what people have written, um, what companies have written, what have they got approval for, and then maybe you need one for a similar type thing and you can use some of the information there. It, these applications, these waivers, will talk about how they're going to mitigate the risk that's associated with bypassing that section of the regulation. So really good information in here. I want to jump into this blog post really quick. Alan Perlman, he's the creator of DronePilotGroundSchool.com. He's got over 2,000 students, over a 99% pass rate. It's what I use to pass. He's uh, wrote this really, really great blog post about your airspace authorizations. Are they getting turned down? And here's why. And he jumps through in here and talks about the information that you would want to put into your waiver, you know, your waiver request and um, the type of stuff that the FAA is looking for and what to make sure that you hit so that you have a better chance of getting your airspace authorization or your waiver granted. So he, um, he's got a really great blog post here. Alan's constantly publishing stuff on the site. And on top of this, <clears throat> he recently made an addition to dronepilotgroundschool.com, which, which I'll go into really quick. He added these four bonus interviews. So really an inside look at running the aerial business. And he had um, an interview with a, with a drone lawyer about key legal considerations for starting a drone business, using drones to do real estate marketing, understanding the drone liability and hull insurance, so insuring your SUAS, and transitioning from part-time to full-time aerial services. So four really great interviews. I recommend that you go through them. If you're part of dronepilotgroundschool.com, they're, um, they're in your course, so go through them. And if you're not, then check out dronepilotgroundschool.com. It is what I recommend to go through. It's what I used. It's what I passed with. Uh, link down below with $50 off. It's a really good information here. I appreciate the questions around waivers, and it showed me I probably needed to make a video on this. Coming up next week, so today, coming in, I got a GoPro Karma that's getting here. So I've got next week is going to be a pretty GoPro heavy week. Going to have the Karma, and I am going to have the Karma up against a Phantom 4, maybe up against a Typhoon H, but show you the video difference between the Karma and the Phantom 4. What does the quality look like? I actually expect the quality to be really good because the GoPro Hero 5 is a great camera. I've got one of those that I'm doing some comparisons on against the Hero 4 series. I'm doing some stuff on a gimbal, electronic stabilization, whatnot. That'll be out next week. Also next week, a good video out about the iPhone 7 Plus versus the Google Pixel and the video quality. So I'm going to shoot part of a video like this with each of them and show you some different, um, some different videos from time-lapse videos to some outdoor scenery. My takes on the iPhone 7 versus the Google Pixel. Google Pixel's outstanding camera-wise. Phone-wise, mm, but camera-wise, it's amazing. So next week... A lot of videos on the GoPro 5, the Karma versus the Phantom 4, the, um, the Google Pixel. So look for those. It's going to be a fun week next week. 
videos at least Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, if not every day next week, so stay tuned. If you haven't yet subscribed, giving away that bag in less than 100 subscribers now, we'll be at 7,500. So look over here, giving away that um, CamSafe Z14 anti-theft bag. And guys, thanks so much for watching. You have an awesome weekend. You keep watching, I'll keep making videos. Thanks a lot.